Hello everyone. In this video, I'll be uh, starting here in 3.2. I'm going to go all the way through up to 8.1. That's a bunch of bunch of stuff in this video. Um, the kind of characteristic that connects all of this is that we're working with uh, lines. Okay, so a straight line such as this one here. Um, there's a pair of kind of important bits of information that, that every line contains as and is defined by. And one of those is called a y-intercept, and we'll talk about talk about that. And then another piece is the slope. So basically how the line is evolving over time. And for that we're going to have a specific formula. That's over here. If you know the y-intercept and the slope, you know everything about the line. There's no other missing information, right? If you know where the line is going through, that's, that's the y-intercept part. And then you know in what direction the line is going. If it's a straight line, you know everything about the line. So let's try one. So example one says, uh, find the slope of the line containing these points, and also graph the line. I'm actually going to do that in reverse, so <clears throat> there's nothing stopping me from just going ahead and plotting these points. So 4, 0, this is x, and this is y. We typically treat the horizontal as x, and the vertical as y. So 4, 0 would mean 1, 2, 3, 4, and then I go 0 up and down, so I'm just left right here. So that's that point four zero, and then negative two three would be here. As soon as I have those two points, there's only one line that connects them. So that'll be the graph part. So I've connected those two points with a straight line, and then I've implied those that line continues forever in that way by using those arrows. But also we were supposed to find the slope. So that comes from this bit of information here. So y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. You can think of that as the rise, so how far up or down you're going from one point to get back to the line. And then the run is how far you're going to the right to get back. So the rise in this case would actually be a negative three, and then the run would be one, two, three, four, five, six. But I'm gonna use a formula. I'm gonna use this formula. So I'll call this x1, y1, and I'll actually call this x2, y2, just to differentiate my first point and my second point. It doesn't matter actually which one you define as your first point and your second point. So even though um, this, what I'm calling the first point, is on the right, it doesn't matter. So the slope between those two points will be y2 minus y1, in other words, 3 minus 0, over x2 minus x1, negative 2 minus 4. And then we reduce this. So I'm getting a 3 over negative 6. And we usually reduce these, so the slope would be negative one-half. What that would mean, just to kind of conceptualize that, the negative one is the rise. So from this point, I go down one. The two is the run, so it's telling me I go down one and over two, and I should be back at the line, and that looks like it's the case. right? Down one, over two, I'm back at the line. Down one, over two, I'm back at the line. That's it. So what if we have an equation, right? So in the previous one, we didn't have an equation. We had a graph, and we were able to pull out that information. So this is an equation, and this equation is said to be in slope-intercept form. And we just saw that m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That m is this m. 
B is the y-intercept of the line. So when you have your equation written in slope-intercept form, you're able to see the slope and you're able to see the y-intercept. So all the kind of distinguishing parts of the line reveal themselves when, they're, when it's written in the slope-intercept form. This is not slope-intercept form. This is actually what's called standard form. And what we want to do is transfer this from standard form to something that looks like y equals mx plus b. So maybe the most important part to focus on is getting y alone, right? That's a main difference between what we have here and what we have here is y is all mixed up with x's and other stuff. So as a way from getting here to here, I'm going to focus on getting y alone. So the first thing I might choose to do is subtract over that 2x. So we have negative 3y equals negative 2x plus 9. And then just one more move, maybe. So divide by negative 3. And now we would have y equals, I'll write negative 2 over negative 3 as positive 2 thirds, so 2 thirds x. 9 divided by negative 3 is negative 3. So keep in mind that the problem was to find the slope and the y-intercept. So this is slope-intercept form. So from there I can see that the slope is two-thirds, right? It's not, it does not involve x, keep in mind. So the slope is just the number attached to x, but it actually doesn't involve x specifically. And then the y-intercept is this point zero, negative three, right? So that's what this is saying, is if you have a number here, then zero and that number is your y-intercept. Okay. Moving on actually all the way to uh, page 38. So once we have multiple lines present, there are different orientations that a pair of lines can, can show, right? This would be a, what we call parallel lines. So this is where we have two lines on one set of axes, but not only that, they're oriented in such a way that they will never intersect. So a mathematical way of describing that would be that they have different y-intercepts, but they have the same slope. That's, that's uh, our mathematical definition of what it means to be parallel. Perpendicular is... Uh, different. <laughs> so this is what perpendicular looks like, and, and in that case you will have an intersection, but not only that, they will be intersecting in a specific way where 90 degree angles are formed around that intersection. So perpendicular means that the lines are intersecting, and that they're intersecting in a way in which they form a 90 degree angle between them. There are a lot of other ways two lines can intersect, right? Here's two lines intersecting, and it doesn't look like any of these angles are 90 degrees. So these are not parallel, but they're also not perpendicular. So for the slope situation, you can see if you start with a slope like A over B, the perpendicular slope will actually be flipping that so we'll take B over A, and then we'll change the sign. So if you start with a slope of A over B, your perpendicular slope will be negative B over A. So down here, we're given a couple lines, and we're just asked, are they parallel, or are they perpendicular, or neither? So I'll go ahead and actually work on the second one. Of course, I'm going to be working on all these other ones separately and then uh, attaching the solutions next to the video. 
So what I'll do is actually turn both of these into slope intercept. Once you have it in slope intercept, you can more readily assess, right, the, the line and its slope and its y-intercept. So what I'll do is actually focus first on this, this first equation, and I'll again just get y alone, right, similar to the one I just did. So I might choose to first bring over this 4x. And that would give us negative 3y equals negative 4x plus 2. And then divide by negative 3. So that first one can be written in slope-intercept form um, as y equals positive 4 thirds x minus 2 thirds. So this is the first one, just written in slope-intercept form. All right, this one. The other one, I still, you know, want to change this into slope-intercept form. So to do that, I'll actually just kind of make a shortcut. I'll start by just adding this 8x. So down here, I'll have 6y equals 8x minus 6. Divide by 6. So in slope-intercept form, the second one, I'll reduce 8 over 6 is the same as 4 thirds, so I'll write y equals 4 thirds x. And then I'll we'll have negative 6 divided by 6 is negative 1. So we're now assessing this as compared to this. And keep in mind, so for parallel, we have the same slope but different y-intercepts. And that's exactly what's going on here, right? We have the same slope, so 4 thirds in each case, and then we have a negative 2 thirds and a negative 1, so same slope, different y-intercept. The conclusion is that these two are parallel. So yeah, in certain cases, the uh, slope and y-intercept will, will tell us um, interesting things about whatever scenario is being described. So in this scenario, we have a car, and the story goes like this. In, in 1957, we're assuming this thing was bought for 1800 bucks. And then what happens is that this car is assumed to depreciate. So it's losing value over time, and it's doing so at a rate of $300 per year. So you buy this thing or someone buys it in 1957 for $1,800. It's probably a lot of money back then. But then, of course, just like a lot of cars, as soon as you drive it off the, the lot, it begins to lose value. Right, and, and we're assuming that that's happening at $300 a year. So maybe you can make some sense out of this equation. So if y is the car's value at a time of years x, then this equation would describe that exactly, the car's value as related to some number of years x. So plug in a zero. Zero would mean in 1957, and the car's value would be 1800 plug in a 1, the 1 would correspond to 1958, right? So just to experiment with that, negative 300 times 1 plus 1800, this would be the car's value in 1958. So we'd be down to $1,500, right? Plug in a 2 and you're down to 1200 and so on. 
So in this case, the 1800 is actually the y-intercept. And conceptually, it actually means something. That, that literally means the price or value of the car at the time of purchase. The negative 300 is how it's depreciating, but it's also what we call the slope. Right? So in this case, the slope means that for every year, $300 is knocked off of the value of the car. If you graph this, you can kind of get a picture going of, of what's happening. Right? So here is the vertical. Here's Y. In other words, the car's value. Here's the car's age. Right, It's brand new right here, zero years old. And then it's one year old, two years old, three years old. So this is what year right here? That is 1960, right? Three years after 1957. So just to make sense of this, this is 1961, 1962. Here's the value of the car. It looks like it goes from 1800 down to zero value in just six years. So we can learn that. This is called a y-intercept. So this is one of the important features or interesting features. So that's called a y-intercept. This is called an x-intercept. And kind of how this is evolving is called the slope. So I would say, what are some interesting features? I would say the intercepts, both X and Y, and the slope. Those are telling us a good amount about the story of this thing, right? It started at 1800, took six years to get down to zero. Those are intercepts. And within those intercepts, we've defined a slope. So how to find intercepts, now that we know that in certain cases they're important. So let me actually just go back. So if you imagine kind of what's going on, right? Um, this point would be the point six zero, right? If I just select some other random point right here, I don't know exactly what the X is. It looks like it's between three and four. But I know, right, I don't know exactly what the x is, but I do know what the y is. It's zero, right? If you're living on this line, that means that you have a zero y component, right? In a similar way, I don't know exactly what I'm selecting there. It looks pretty close to a half, but, but I don't know exactly. But what I'm meaning to do is write this dot exactly on this line. So I would know that in all cases, if you are living on this line, you're called an x-intercept. If you're an x-intercept, for sure I know your y component is zero. All right, that's a kind of related trait amongst all these x-intercepts. In a similar but kind of opposite kind of way, if you, if you look at this point, maybe I'll use blue. Eh, I'll go with this one. That would be the point zero in 1800. All right, this point. And it has a zero in its x. And, and it is true that wherever you select, whatever y-intercept you have, I know I have a zero there, and I'm not exactly sure what y it is. And it's not the point. Don't, don't focus too much on the question marks. It's really, my point is about the zeros here. Right? Any time that you identify a y-intercept, it would be a matter of having a zero in for x and then some number in for y. Right? I don't know exactly what number I'm meaning. Maybe I'm meaning 400. But for sure, if I'm on that axis, I have a zero as my x component. That's a conceptual thing, and I say all that to bring us here. So if you're looking for intercepts, let's, let's first talk about x-intercepts. So what you do to find x-intercepts is you let y equal zero, right? Because on the previous page, 
that was a true thing about all those hypothetical x-intercepts is although we weren't sure exactly where their x was um, the assumption is that they're sitting right on that line so they must have a zero in their y component so if you're looking for them kind of in a reverse way then you can go ahead and force the issue you can say okay let's let's let the y be zero when I do that, I'll go looking for x's. Those x's must be y-intercepts. So this is exactly what I'll do, is I'll have 4x minus 3 times 0, and set that equal to 12. Right, this term vanishes. So this is the same as 4x equals 12, and divide by that 4. So x equals 3 would be the 0 there. But then to write an x-intercept, we usually want to write the full-fledged point. So 3, 0. Why is it 0? Because that's what we did. We let y equal 0, and out of that uh, came this 3. It says find the intercepts. So let's find the y-intercept. To find a y-intercept, we let x equal 0. So I'll have 4 times 0 minus 3y equals 12. These, right, that goes away, that's a 0. So I just have negative 3y equals 12, and then divide by that negative 3. So y would equal negative 4, maybe I'll write it up here, 0, negative 4, right? The 0 goes in for x this time, because that's exactly what we did, is we let x be 0, so that forces this, and we are able to solve for the y-intercept. So as I was saying earlier, if you have two points that you know are on the line, then you know the entire line. Okay, so here I'm going to graph, and it says specifically using intercepts. So 2x plus 3y equals 6. It says graph using the intercepts. Okay. So let's go ahead and find the x-intercept. So just as before, we let y equal 0, and then we solve for x. So we'll have 2x. And then I'll just set that equal to 6. Why is that just equal to 6? Because I'm letting this y equal 0. So that whole term just vanishes. So I just kind of skipped a step. Then solve for x. We divide by 2. I get x equals 3. And now I know that there's an x-intercept at 3, 0 for this line. So I'll go ahead and make that point there. Similar stuff, right? Go back, similar thing. So for the y-intercept, we let x equal 0. All right, if you're looking for the y-intercept, that means you're letting the other variable equal 0. So I'm now letting this equal 0, so that whole term goes away, and I just have 3y equals 6. And divide by 3, we get y equals 2. So in other words, the point 0, 2 is the y-intercept, so 0, 2. And now I have two points. And I just need to make the straight line through those two points. And don't forget about your arrows. Okay. All right, so determining, I'm going to page 43. 
So determining whether uh, these equations are linear equations. So it says determine whether the following equations are linear equations. If the equation is linear, put it into slope intercept form and state the slope in the y intercept. So the, the concept here is if it's linear, then it should be possible to write y equals mx plus b. If it's not linear, then we won't be able to write it into this form. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of rework this and see if I can get this into y equals mx plus b. If I can, then that tells me this thing is linear. And since it's linear, I would want to go ahead and write down the slope and the y-intercept. Okay, so maybe the first thing I'll do is distribute that 4. So I have y minus 8 equals 4x minus 8 minus 7. Maybe combine these, so y minus 8 equals 4x minus 15. And then it looks like adding 8. All right, so I'm, I'm trying to form this. This is like the goal. So that's kind of what's guiding my work here. Adding 8, we get y equals 4x minus 7. So I would say linear with a slope of 4 and a y-intercept of 0, negative 7. So maybe I'll just box all of that. <laughs> so part two, again, I, I'm again trying to create this. If this is achievable, then that means this thing is linear. If this is not achievable, then this thing is not linear, and I'll just say not linear in that case. Okay, so I want to get y alone, right? That's kind of the guiding force. I want to get that y alone, so I'll first subtract 7. So 13 equals 2xy. Getting y alone, again, this is my goal. So I'm just focusing on getting y alone, and then I'll step back and see what we have. So divide by 2x, we get 13 over 2x equals y. And now the question is, does this look like this, right? Even if I switch it around, and the, this order doesn't matter, but my question is, does this look like this up here? And no, that x is up in the numerator. This x is in the denominator. So no. So I'll just say not linear. I don't know, it didn't really tell me what to do. Linear. Okay. All right, a couple more. So I know we're packing a lot into this video. So finding equations of lines, solving linear applications. We're getting toward the end of the video here. This is 3.5, 8.1. So it says, use the graph to find the equation of each line. So now we have a graph, and I want something like y equals mx plus b. I want to know basically what m and b are for this, for this thing here. So what I recommend is first finding the slope. So the slope, just to remind you, is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I will go ahead and make a choice. I'll say this is my x1, y1, and this is my x2, y2. 
So the slope in that case would be negative 4 minus 3 over 5 minus 1. And then we want to simplify that if possible. So negative 7 over 4 is the slope. Okay, so I actually just figured out what this one is. So we know that we're sitting right here at y equals negative 7 fourths x plus b. And we still need to figure out what b is. So how do we do that? Well, one way would be to guess, and that's not what we're going to do, but you can kind of see right about there. I'm not going to zoom in, but you can kind of see where a y-intercept is implied to be, right? Kind of near 5 or 4, somewhere in there. But I want to know what this is exactly, right? I don't want to depend on my eyes. So this is really where the math comes in. So what we then do is we use one of these points. So what I'm going to choose is, is just to use this point. And what we're going to do is place a 3 right there for y. And we're going to place a 1 right there for x. Then that's going to leave b to be solved for. So we'll have 3 equals negative 7 fourths times 1 plus b. And I'll go ahead and solve for b. Apparently, I'm expecting something close to 5. So negative 7 fourths times 1 is still just negative 7 fourths. So I'm going to add 7 fourths to both sides. Okay, so on the right, these cancel. And now I'll type this in. So 3 plus fraction 7 over 4. It equals 19 fourths. So this is telling me that B is 19 fourths. Just to make sense out of that, if you want, you can press S to D. So 4.75. So just to write this equation in its full glory now, we have Y equals negative 7 fourths. X plus... 19 fourths. That is the equation of this line. Let's try another one that's, that's similar. So example three, this is on page 45. I'm not gonna actually talk about point slope form. Let's just stick with slope intercept form. That's enough. So actually just switch that out for slope intercept form. So using slope intercept form, find the equation of the line passing through these points, put the final answer into slope intercept form, y equals mx plus b. So with two points, you can find a slope. So I'll go ahead and call this x1, y1, x2, y2. Keep in mind, the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So y2 is 3 minus 5 over x2 minus x1. So 2 minus negative 2. Right? This, this negative is in the formula. This negative is in the point. So we need both. Right? And they are going to turn into addition here in a second. So negative 2 over, this turns into 2 plus 2. So negative 2 over 4, that's the same as negative 1 half. Right? That is the slope. We still need to figure out the y-intercept. So just as before, we go back and we select one of these points. It doesn't matter which one you use. I'll just use this one for no good reason. 
I'll plug those in for x and y with the slope. That'll allow me to solve for b. So I'll go ahead and do that here. So I have 3 equals negative 1 half times 2 plus b. All right, here's my y. So I brought that in to y. I brought the 2 in for x. And I'm using the slope we just found. So negative 1 half of 2. So this is 3 equals negative 1 plus b. And then add 1. So 4 equals b. And then I'll write this answer. So we'll have y equals negative 1 half x uh, plus 4. Go to page 46, example 4. It says, find an equation of the line that is perpendicular to this given line, but not only that, we want a line that is passing through 6, negative 1. Right? I'm going to sketch. I, I probably should have brought up Desmos at this point, but I'm just going to sketch like what a picture of this problem would, would basically look like. Sorry about that. So here we have a given line. Let me just kind of estimate it like that. And then here we have a given point. 6, negative 1 would be like over here, roughly. Okay, so here's a, here's a picture. Here's the given line. Here's the given point. So what we're looking for is a line that contains this point. But not only that, we want that line to be perpendicular to that line in red. So we're looking for that blue line, just to kind of sketch the picture of what we're doing, right? We have a given line. We have a point that is askew from that line. In other words, it's not on the line. And we're being asked to, to find a perpendicular line to this line containing this point. Right, so there would be infinitely many perpendicular lines, right? My pencil is basically perpendicular to that red one. Anywhere we slide that pen, that, those are all perpendicular, but there's only one that meets both requirements. Okay, <laughs> so something we noted earlier in the video. So we are given this slope of three sevenths. What we want is to transfer this into a perpendicular slope. Sometimes we use this notation to represent perpendicular. And basically what is true, and another way to formalize it, is if you have m times a perpendicular slope, that is always equal to negative one. So when you take slopes that are perpendicular to one another and multiply them, you always get negative 1 out of that. So if I know m is 3 sevenths, so I can plug in 3 sevenths, multiply that by the perpendicular slope, this should be equal to negative 1. So solve for the perpendicular slope. So 3 sevenths, 3 sevenths. And this is telling me that the perpendicular slope is negative one divided by three sevenths. So fraction, negative one divided by another fraction, three over seven hit equals negative seven thirds. So we have negative seven thirds. That is the perpendicular slope that we're gonna use. So right now I know that we have some equation, like y equals negative 7 thirds x plus some b that we still need to find. 
How do we find that B? We use the point. So I'll have negative 1 equals negative 7 thirds times 6 plus B. All right, I'm using this point and I'm plugging that in here. So it looks like I have negative 7 thirds times 6. So I can actually just press times 6 because on the previous screen was negative 7 thirds. So negative 14. So I have negative 1 equals negative 14 plus b. And add 14. So it looks like we get 13 equals b. So the problem was to find an equation, so I need to write an equation. y equals negative 7 thirds x plus 13. So this is the specific line that we are looking for here, this dotted. All right, it's both containing the given point and perpendicular to the given equation. just one more in the video. So let's see, it says, while you're on spring break in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, the cost C in dollars of your taxi ride from the airport to your hotel can be represented by this equation. Okay, so C is in dollars, so this is the cost that you would see on the uh, kind of meter, you know, in that taxi, when taxis used to exist. And M is the amount of miles that you're going to go. So kind of in a confusing way, M now is acting like X was, right? M is not the slope in this case, 2.4, is this is the slope, right? So in our Y equals MX plus B, the slope is always just attached to the variable. In this case, our variable is m, so it's kind of confusing maybe. Let me write our equation again just so we can see it. So what will an 8-mile taxi ride cost? So 8 miles means I'm going to plug in 8 right here for m. I'll do 2.4 times it, and then I'll add $2.10. So the cost would be 2.1 plus 2.4 times 8. So this is how much it would cost to travel 8 miles. Okay, so 2.10 times 2.40, sorry, plus, plus 2.40 times 8. So kind of a weird result, but again, this S to D button, so $21.30. How many miles can you ride if you budget $35 for the taxi? So now this is asking a different question, right? Like what if you had 35 bucks in your, in your pocket and you just want to go as far as you can? How far can you go? So 35 is now going to come in over here for the cost. And then we have 2.10 plus 2.40 M. And now it's M, which is not the slope. The slope is 2.4, but M is what we're looking for, the number of miles that we can go for 35 bucks. So 35 minus 2.1 is... 32.9, and then that would equal 2.40 times m, and then divide by 2.4. Might get a weird number here, but that's what calculators are for. So 32.9 divided by 2.4, it equals, this is how far you can go, 
if you press S to D, it's still a strange number. That bar over the three means that three actually continues forever. So I'm going to write that. So 13.7083, then that bar over it literally means that that just is a repeating three after that. And this would be a number of miles. All right. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.